Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would now like to start uh, the arts and science session. Uh, theme two, symbiosis, the world of uh, symbiosis from cells to the universe. I would like to, first of all, uh, introduce uh, the speakers uh, for the session. Mr. Masatoshi Funabashi, uh, in the area of uh, uh, food production, uh, he is uh, a proponent of uh, uh, sign uh, eco uh, culture, uh, working in the greening of uh, deserted areas. And he is putting uh, the symbiosis uh, into practice uh, in food production so that the uh, um, recovery of uh, the ecology can be achieved. Ona Haga. Uh, Ms. Ona Haga, uh, utilizing uh, technology uh, in the area of art and to uh, position uh, science as a part of culture. Uh, is the area she focuses on. Uh, Art, the Science Museum uh, is where she is serving as the executive director for TED and uh, the conference. Uh, in many fora, she is making presentations. Uh, Mr. Christopher Mason, uh, genetics and uh, epigenetic changes in single cells uh, uh, is area he is working on. Uh, he is uh, developing uh, computational methods as well as uh, applications uh, in this area. And uh, the gene uh, evolution, DNA, and RNA, and uh, uh, genome and epigenome areas where he is uh, working on uh, different algorithms uh, and uh, pursuing uh, state-of-the-art technologies uh, in uh, this area. And uh, Ms. Rena Okajima. Uh, while she was in the science faculty of uh, the University of Tokyo, uh, in the faculty of uh, astronomy, and she has established a, a science uh, and entertainment uh, company. Uh, games as well as uh, uh, industry academia and collaboration services have been set up, uh, which has been adopted by JAXA. Uh, she is currently the president uh, of the uh, LL. Ms. Ariel Ekbro at the MIT Media Lab uh, in the aeronautic uh, uh, structural area. Uh, she is uh, uh, doing her doctorate course. Uh, in more than 40, uh, fac 40 facilities uh, is uh, included in the MIT lab. And uh, this is a space exploration initiative, uh, which is uh, uh, covering areas of uh, science, engineering, arts, and uh, design uh, in pursuing uh, 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 new universe exploration. Now, uh, the moderators uh, for uh, this session uh, will be Mr. Fumio Nanjo, director of the uh, Moriatu Museum, as well as uh, Mr. Hiroaki Kitano, the president and CEO of uh, Sony Computer Science and Laboratories. Nanjo, sir, please. Hi, Omoto. Thank you very much. So, we'd like to start the afternoon session. So the, uh, the opening talk that has just uh, the, uh, completed, I already communicated the, uh, the uh, basic purpose of this session. 
And the uh, first session, particularly first uh, part, about the, uh, the symbiosis uh, from the cells to the uh, universe, we are going to invite two presentations. And the first presenter is Mr. Funabashi. Mr. Funabashi, we uh, was already introduced earlier. So the, uh, the food production and the uh, needed by the human beings and the limitation that we have to face and the possibility of future agriculture, that is the topic of Mr. Funabashi. So the floor is yours, Mr. Funabashi. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Funabashi. I've been come back to Roppong Hill uh, after uh, some time. Uh, I think it was in 2003 when I came to uh, Roppong Hills for the first time. I thought that uh, uh, it's a megapolis, uh, s something uh, from uh, SF world. I was very impressed. But uh, this uh, um, image of uh, creation has now been realized uh, in the form of Roppongi Hills. And I thought uh, that uh, about the possibility of uh, these buildings uh, spreading all over uh, Tokyo and Japan and the world. And I think that uh, uh, I thought that that was highly unlikely because there are two reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, because uh, this is uh, using too much energy and too much resources. So uh, the, uh, the, the Earth does not have enough uh, resources to realize uh, 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 this uh, image. And uh, in reality, uh, this alone will not suffice. Uh, it needs uh, the community. It needs uh, the food producing regions. It needs the connectivity to the society. Uh, it needs uh, also a human connectivity. So from these two perspectives, I thought at that time that uh, uh, this building is uh, not going to be uh, spreading all over Japan. So, but uh, Tokyo is a very dense uh, city. And uh, after the Industrial uh, Revolution for the 19th century, uh, food had been uh, provided. Uh, this is the Huna's uh, model. You can see the bullseye in the middle. Uh, this is uh, the dairy and market gardening, and uh, forests and fuels is covering that. And uh, then uh, greens and field crops and uh, green areas uh, are surrounding that. Even in the 21st century, this model remains uh, basically intact. Uh, it's a very reasonable, rational uh, model uh, based on uh, computations and mathematics. And uh, as you know, uh, the world has become uh, globalized, uh, and similar cities have emerged uh, globally, and uh, similar lifestyles are being pursued. I went to Paris uh, uh, last week, and uh, um, even Japanese food is available there. And you know, there are uh, fields and uh, agricultural land uh, that is supporting uh, the, uh, the community. So it's a bipolarization uh, that uh, uh, we are seeing today. Now, against this backdrop uh, of uh, uh, bipolarization, bipolarization uh, the food uh, sufficiency uh, must be considered. Uh, if uh, Japan becomes isolated, we will not be able to sustain ourselves because uh, we are not uh, self-sufficient uh, in terms of food. For each of these uh, uh, agricultural crops, uh, uh, we have not uh, reached a 100% level in terms of agricultural production. But uh, we are not uh, starving because uh, we are importing uh, from overseas countries. It's an uh, economic uh, exchange of uh, uh, goods is allowing us to sustain ourselves. But I think uh, diversity uh, is necessary. It doesn't mean that we have to always be 100%. Tanegashima Island uh, has the highest level of self-sufficiency. Uh, and uh, it is also a location from where uh, the rockets and uh, sunlights are launched. So uh, there is some sufficiency uh, in terms of uh, potatoes as well as dairy products. And uh, this is exported to the mainland. But if you look at uh, uh, eggs and poultry, you can be self-sufficient easily. But uh, uh, nevertheless, the self-sufficiency is very low. So Tanegashima cannot uh, uh, be isolated, even with the sufficiency. 
a 100% su uh, sufficiency. So you have to have uh, diversity, diversity uh, at the core. I went to France and I thought about uh, uh, the resilience of uh, cities. I was engaged uh, in a discussion for about uh, 10 hours every day on this very topic. And I was uh, eating uh, uh, French cuisine, and uh, this is the uh, famous souffle. Now, even if it's less than 100% of self-sufficiency, uh, we can uh, sustain ourselves. We can live uh, because of uh, the economy on top of the natural resources. It's very similar to the souffle structure. Let me explain. Uh, the um, so uh, below there is a uh, natural resources uh, inclusive of uh, diversity, and uh, um, the bubbly formation uh, is created on top of the natural resources, which is the economy. So even with the natural resources as well as uh, the self-sufficiency may be different from country to country, uh, we can have uh, uh, very uh, stable uh, structure. But radish could be 100 yen, and uh, there could be 20,000 radish. And uh, it uh, can be uh, exchanged with a car, for example. But it's only being done by humans. But uh, a radish can never form a car physically in the physical world. So it is uh, uh, very subjective. But I am have clothes on, and I'm not a hunger. I'm not suffering from hunger because of uh, the buffer, uh, which is provided uh, by the economy. But there is bipolarization uh, in the economy. But uh, this is uh, reaching the limit. Uh, uh, when the computer was introduced uh, uh, back in 1972, uh, there was a Club of Rome report uh, that came out. Uh, it said uh, that uh, 30 years down the road. Uh, even with the verification uh, using that uh, computer at that time, their forecast was correct. Because uh, the, um, the natural resources that cannot be uh, recovered uh, will be depleted. That means that the souffle will disintegrate. And there is also pollution, uh, which means that uh, it is undermining the health of uh, the humans. Uh, so this is a very pessimistic scenario uh, that is shown in this uh, graph. Uh, but uh, in 2030 or 2040, a very dismal um, uh, turning point uh, will be before us. But against this backdrop, uh, we have to think about agriculture. Um, even uh, we are lacking all, uh, uh, oil, we are continuing to use fossil fuels. You can see that uh, the energy input uh, and uh, uh, how much uh, 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 is produced. Uh, there is a uh, more uh, um, oil input rather than the output. Uh, because uh, we have uh, photosynthesis, uh, you don't need uh, uh, oil, but we're using oil for uh, agriculture, and uh, the output uh, is less than the input. So this is a uh, very low efficiency. So it would be better for humans to just drink the oil rather than use it uh, in this way and in this inefficient way. To the agriculture land, the various input uh, are, will be used. And uh, there is uh, the uh, nutrients uh, that uh, going through the water system uh, is uh, uh, disintegrated uh, and uh, has uh, reached a stage where recovery cannot be uh, expected. But people continue to use fertilizers, nevertheless. So let's look at the agriculture land. You, there, it looks as if uh, there is accumulation uh, of uh, um, substances. Uh, but if you uh, cut trees, uh, carbon will go into the air. And if you till the land from the groundwater, uh, there will be dispersion. And uh, all the fertilizers that uh, are provided in input uh, will uh, go into groundwater, which cannot be recovered. Therefore, by uh, expanding agriculture, uh, the nutrients uh, will be lost. And the CO2 emissions is considered to be a problem 25% uh, or uh, 40 percent uh, uh, is uh, caused by agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. 
there is also the issue of climate change. And uh, on top of that, uh, through agriculture, the uh, biodiversity is being lost. Uh, they uh, are at the brink of uh, uh, extinction. According to the research, even in natural uh, state, uh, the living animals uh, will uh, become extinct. Uh, but uh, the space uh, is being accelerated by a factor of 500 uh, or even 1,000 because of agriculture today. So if we continue this course, uh, there will be uh, deserts appearing uh, uh, in various areas of the earth. And uh, in 2045, uh, the biodiversity will be completely deteriorated, unable to recover uh, in the time frame of 2045, according to the Rome Club, the Club of Rome. No, uh, we are always uh, measuring economic growth by GDP growth. But uh, that is an uh, exponential uh, system. Uh, but uh, uh, this is going beyond uh, the uh, ecosystem. So uh, sigmoid-like growth will have to be uh, achieved. So how can this be uh, realized uh, is the issue. Currently, we, are, we have to change the way we consume goods. Uh, in particular, uh, for food production, is not just having a detrimental impact on consumption, but it is also having a, a negative impact uh, on the environment as well. So uh, we are trying to go to the sigma type of growth, but the uh, industry is not following suit. So we are at uh, a very dire situation. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, natural resources, uh, there are material resources which will become depleted. And uh, there is yield in terms of recycling. So over the long term, uh, it, it will be uh, diminished. But the other natural resources, biodiversity, but this can be recovered. Uh, even though uh, it is uh, uh, declared there are natural calamities. Uh, in the past, uh, there have been 70%, uh, 80% uh, um, uh, degradation of biodiversity on five occasions in the Earth's history already. But still, uh, the biodiversity had, had then uh, recovered in the solar system and the Earth environment. As long as it is uh, contained, uh, there is that life will continue to uh, be maintained. So what is uh, going to be utilized is life. So life uh, uh, can be connected with life, uh, which is the answer to uh, agricultural food production. And that is the reason why I have come up uh, with the uh, cynical culture. This is using uh, all the living uh, uh, systems uh, to engage in agriculture, uh, establish an ecosystem such as a forest. Uh, this is about 1,000 square meters with 150 uh, types of crop. And uh, there is no tillage, no fertilizer, no chemicals, because we want to maintain a natural environment. Uh, but uh, it is highly intelligent uh, method. And uh, we have to be careful in uh, the uh, crop uh, distribution. Uh, so it has to be managed uh, very carefully. And there is uh, uh, enormous uh, scientific uh, knowledge uh, that is supporting such a system. I don't have time to elaborate, but uh, based on biodiversity, uh, there are the ecosystem uh, and uh, the uh, that uh, will be developed, and biodiversity can um, also develop a further biodiversity. Uh, this uh, has been tested uh, in Japan for about three years. Uh, 80 kinds of uh, produce uh, was uh, produced. And uh, 80 kinds uh, is a scale of uh, prefecture level. So that's uh, adaptive uh, diversification. And according to Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries, uh, compared to that, uh, 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 the yield uh, can be increased by two times or four times uh, through biodiversity. Uh, yield uh, is increased, and uh, uh, effective ingredients uh, can be increased uh, through diversity as well. The red points here shows uh, the 
200 ingredients that have been identified. Uh, in the past, uh, humans used to uh, eat uh, uh, such uh, crops and uh, maintain their health, but with the monoculture, uh, this uh, uh, healthiness uh, has been lost. Uh, currently, 40% um, um, of the national budget uh, is uh, uh, medical expenses. Uh, doctors can no longer uh, fix this problem. We have to make ourselves healthier uh, through food. I also have a, a physical uh, physics uh, background, uh, so I modeled uh, this uh, process. And I focused on uh, the desert. I thought that uh, in a desert environment, uh, we can bring to bear the synergy. We went to the Sahara. Uh, Burkina Faso is where we went. And uh, we worked uh, with the NGO uh, to uh, start uh, the crop production uh, using uh, the method of uh, Sineco culture. Uh, there are low cost. A uh, low price uh, uh, land that we acquired, and uh, this is uh, one year after on the left hand side. Just with one year, one year of uh, 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 Sinico culture, we were able to uh, create such greenery. Lush greens uh, were created. This is not just about the recovery of uh, the forests. but uh, it also had a significant economic impact as well in terms of. Uh, the revenue uh, in the past, compared to the past, uh, they were able to uh, increase the revenue by 40 times or 150 times uh, compared to conventional farming. Uh, there was a significant excitement uh, locally. Uh, we held an uh, international forum, uh, invited uh, researchers, and uh, the politicians uh, also uh, came along, and we decided to spread this practice uh, all over the country. We also established a research and training center uh, locally. And there, from this point onward, uh, uh, because of the uh, climate change, uh, many uh, people are becoming interested in Sinaco uh, culture. Uh, so it is spreading uh, significantly globally. So I think we'll be able to have come up with the uh, cynical culture uh, prototype, which can be used in all uh, climate conditions. Usually when diversity goes up, uh, uh, the utility will go down. Uh, the economic utility will go down. But on the other hand, if we reduce uh, diversity, it is easier to control. Monoculture is a good case in point. There is economic uh, impact, but uh, there is a trade-off. But uh, you can see where the uh, cynical culture is positioned. Uh, it is uh, highly, uh, it's high in terms of diversity and high in terms of utility as well. There was a calculation beforehand, and we expected this because of the complex system uh, that was mentioned earlier. And uh, the uh, complex systems uh, synergies uh, can be optimized to uh, bring about this, uh, uh, this result. And uh, uh, there is ICT uh, support uh, driving uh, this. Uh, people talk about uh, the fourth industrialization. And there is a good uh, synergy uh, that uh, can be brought to bear if we are able to manage the process using ICT. So uh, we have uh, created a management system. And this is the reason why uh, computer science, uh, uh, Sony's uh, uh, laboratory was involved. We're using uh, uh, big data. We are also using uh, uh, artificial intelligence, AR, VR, exploration interface. Uh, and uh, this uh, development uh, is uh, ongoing uh, on a global scale today. So with the fourth industrialization, with agricultural land and cities, uh, uh, bipolarization in terms of uh, a societal uh, landscape uh, will change uh, in terms of agriculture. Uh, in the past, we have the left-hand side. Uh, there are many producers uh, uh, which are provided to many consumers, but uh, it is uh, first uh, uh, provided to supermarkets, uh, uh, intermediary. So intermediary uh, is... Uh, uh, controlling the market, uh, uh, they will have an impact in terms of cultivation method uh, as uh, well as uh, food distribution as well. Uh, that is the reason why we have food loss uh, of uh, one third, 30%. Uh, 
But uh, with the uh, new uh, agriculture method, uh, we can have peer-to-peer -peer, uh, distribution. There is no uh, producer specifically or consumer specifically. Uh, so it could be a producer, you could be a, a cook, or you can also be the consuming side. Uh, so um, matching of various products and services will be enabled. Uh, this is uh, very robust uh, against climate change as well. So uh, let's go back to 15 years ago. I would like to offer my uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, we have a souffle structure. Uh, it's centralized. And uh, uh, function-wise, uh, it is important because it is very efficient. However, when it is uh, centralized, uh, uh, there is a risk of uh, receiving an attack at the core. And uh, ultimately, it will be uh, beset with resource depletions. Therefore, it is not sustainable. So uh, we have to have a distributed uh, social ecological system based on biodiversity. So decentralization is necessary. Uh, you have to have uh, uh, a universal uh, outlook. Uh, this uh, 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 on the right-hand side is looking at uh, the hotspots. Uh, it used to be uh, good agricultural land, uh, but uh, because of industrialization, uh, uh, it has been lost. And uh, I overlaid this uh, uh, with the uh, superimposed this uh, with the internet connection. So uh, there is good affinity here uh, for the industrialization uh, can be utilized, uh, and by so doing, uh, uh, the crisis can be avoided. What are the advantages? Uh, uh, it will lead to the reduction and increase of uh, natural resources. On the other hand, uh, this is going to be very costly because uh, decentralization will require cost. Uh, similar uh, cost uh, is incurred uh, for renewable energies. But uh, uh, when there is a hurricane, uh, um, support uh, will have to be provided from uh, the uh, center as well. So I think uh, uh, both sides uh, can complement each other uh, in order to enhance the resilience overall. That's all for me. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Mr. Fudabashi, thank you very much for the presentation. Next, uh, we would like to invite uh, Ms. Onahaja. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for having to speak to you um, in English. Um, I wanted to extend my uh, sincere thanks to uh, Fumio Nanjo and the whole team involved in Innovative City Forum for the invitation to be here today. Um, my name is Anna, and I'm the Director of Art Science Museum in Singapore. And today, I'd like to address the topic of this session, uh, From Cells to the Universe, by introducing three exhibitions which we staged at my museum uh, earlier this year, which transported visitors um, from inner space to outer space. Um, by way of introduction, this is Art Science Museum in Singapore, and we explore the intersection between art, science, culture, and technology. We create exhibitions that feature some of the big names um, within art who explore science, such as Leonardo da Vinci and MC Escher, as well as staging exhibitions that explore aspects of science, such as recently particle physics, marine biology, and space exploration. Our role is to craft, to craft exhibitions, programs, and experiences that show what happens when artists are thinking just as hard about science and technology as the scientists and the engineers are. 
And speaking of scientists, earlier this year at Art Science Museum, we had the pleasure of hosting one of the world's leading scientists, Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal. During his lecture at Art Science Museum, Lord Rees discussed this image here, which he describes as his personal motto for his research. As it's deeply relevant to our panel here today, let me share his words with you. This image depicts rather nicely the interconnectedness of the microworld on the left and the cosmos on the right, the inner space of atoms and the outer space of the universe. To illustrate this interconnectedness that Lord Rees refers to, and to it further expand on the topic of our session, From Cells to the Universe, I'd like to introduce three exhibitions. The first addresses the cellular reference in our panel, specifically the human body, and how it is evolving through advancements in science and technology. The second explored the universe. And the third fused both subjects in a resonant journey that began with nature and ended in celestial space. So the first, Human Plus, The Future of Our Species, is a show that explores what it means to be human. Advances in robotics, genetic engineering, and biotechnology that not long ago seemed purely science fiction are now real. Cyborgs, superhumans, and clones are alive amongst us today, such as Neil Harbison here, the world's first government-recognized cyborg. So what does it mean to be human now? Should we continue to embrace modifications to our minds and our bodies, or are there boundaries we shouldn't overstep? Human Plus explores the possible future paths of humanity. It asks what it means to be human in a world of artificial intelligence, lifelike robots, and genetic modification. Developed by the Science Gallery in Dublin, the Centre for Contemporary Culture in Barcelona, and us at the Art Science Museum, the show probes the social and ethical questions raised by using science and technology to modify ourselves. It begins by exploring how technology, when fused with the human body, creates something new, something other, a topic addressed by the seminal performance artist Dalak in his work for many decades now. And Human Plus includes three new performances by Stalak, including this work here. The exhibition continues by examining what it is that we consider to be intrinsically human, and what parts of our humanity we might be prepared to outsource to machines. We're in the process, as we heard in Massa's presentation, of drastically transforming the planet that we live on and the environment that we're living within. The exhibition asks how we might have to modify ourselves to adapt to the Anthropocene. Where might our food come from? if our food supply collapses. In a world of genetically modified organisms, what is natural and what's synthetic? The show ends by asking, what does it mean to create life or modify life? It includes these uncanny sculptures of human babies created by the British artist and designer Agatha Haynes. Each has a surgically implemented body modification designed to solve a future problem that the baby might have, ranging from medical or environmental issues to social mobility issues. The artwork asks how far might parents go to give their child an advantage? What circumstances justify modifying the body of a child? This section of the show also includes pioneering work by the artists Oren Katz and the Anna Zer, who grow their sculptures in a biomedical laboratory. Neither alive nor dead, their works challenge our concept of life, consisting of cells sustained by a life support machine. 
So Human Plus addresses the very fundamentals of cellular life. Whilst the exhibition that was running alongside it, the universe and art, explored the heavens. This was a collaboration with Fumio Nanjo and his team right here at the Mori Art Museum. The show wove a rich constellation of Eastern and Western philosophies, ancient and contemporary art, as well as science and religion, to explore how humanity has contemplated the universe. Following the presentation here at the Mori Art Museum, the Singapore edition featured over 120 artworks and scientific artefacts from around the globe and across the centuries. It began with the historical cosmologies from around the world, showing how the Buddhist, Hindu and Jain traditions conceived of the cosmos as vast and multidimensional right from the beginning. The birth of astronomy as a science was charted through a remarkable collection of star charts from ancient China and Japan. In one of the highlights of the show, we were able to present in Singapore for the first time uh, first edition manuscripts by Nicholas Copernicus, Galileo, Johannes Kepler and, uh, and Isaac Newton. And alongside these texts were scientific masterpieces from the ancient Islamic world, including texts by pioneering astronomers like Zachariah al Khwarizmi. The second part of the exhibition explored more recent scientific concepts. Thanks to extraordinary advances in technology, radical new theories, and vast international science endeavors, we're now living through a golden age of discovery in astronomy. Yet despite this progress in our scientific understanding, much is still unknown. Scientists now believe that 95% of the universe is comprised of mysterious substances and forces called dark matter and dark energy, which defy explanation. Artists such as Conrad Shawcross here, who was commissioned for this exhibition, as well as Bjorn Dalem and Mariko Mori, invited us to ponder these mysteries. Also on show were three of the world's leading contemporary photographers, Trevor Paglin, Wolfgang Tillmans, and Andreas Gursky. They presented stunning depictions of new instruments, like Super Kamiya Candy here, designed to observe the universe. The potential for life in other parts of the universe has been a constant source of fascination for both artists and scientists alike. The third part of the exhibition addressed the origin of life in the cosmos and asked, are we alone? Our understanding of the cosmos as a place for humanity was revolutionized by the space age. Since Yuri Gagarin became the first person in space in 1961, 533 people have orbited Earth. In the final section of the exhibition, we showed how artists have been working with space programs since the very beginning. We showed how several artists, including Andy Warhol, have artworks resting on the surface of the moon. We showed sculptures designed for space stations and choreography in theatre devised for the zero gravity of space by performing artists such as Dragon Zhividinov. Humanity has always looked to art, mythology, and philosophy in an attempt to fathom the universe and its mysteries. The universe and art showed how these fields, when combined with the understanding generated by science, gives us new insights into the cosmos. The show was a confluence between the terrestrial and the celestial, the real and the fictional, the poetic and the technological. Finally, the third exhibition at Art Science Museum took our visitors on an immersive journey from inner to outer space. Future World, where art meets science, is the permanent exhibition of Art Science Museum and is a collaboration with Team Lab from here in Japan. One of the main themes in this exhibition is nature. 
These artworks by Team Lab use both art and science to bring us inside natural worlds comprised entirely of digital technology. Throughout the exhibition, animals and plants drawn by the visitors come to life and interact with their creators. The works employ a philosophy of composition, which Team Lab describe as ultra-subjective space. It's rooted in the traditions of 17th century Japanese painting. By eschewing single point perspective and instead physically positioning the viewer inside the landscape, Team Lab are inviting us to understand that nature is something that includes, enfolds, and embraces people and the things they make. There is no separation between ourselves and nature. So Future World is a place to reflect on the natural world. Visitors of all ages can create their own natural environments through touch, movement and collaboration. It's a thoughtful balance of levity and seriousness that raises questions about our position relative to the natural world, other people and the universe. Synthesizing our two topics today, the exhibition ends by taking visitors upwards and outwards into outer space. This artwork here is called Crystal Universe. It puts us right in the heart of the cosmos itself enabling visitors to experience astrophysical phenomena such as planets, stars, galaxies, and comets. And visitors can change the fabric of the universe by sending planets and stars through the universe. This is something that illustrates how the universe enfolds us, how we are indeed part of celestial space. Taken together, these three exhibitions truly represent a journey from cells to the universe. As the astronomer royal Lord Martin Rees says, the inner space of cells and the outer space of the universe are intimately connected. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would now like to engage in discussions. The speakers and moderators who are kindly requested to come onto the stage. Okay, please start. Now uh, we received uh, presentations from uh, two presenters. And it seems that uh, they were widely apart, but yet there was connectivity between the two. And you uh, covered uh, uh, micro as well as macroscopic uh, aspects. And it was very much in line with the Funabachi san's view as well. So I think you're looking at uh, the Earth uh, from way up, uh, from taking a macroscopic view. But now uh, we have uh, three other uh, people joining us uh, in the session. So uh, we will also uh, receive uh, um, information from others. So. We would like to have uh, each uh, person to say a few words uh, before we engage in discussions. So, Kitano-san, please. Now, on the stage, to the non-Japanese person, uh, we are uh, getting the devices ready for everyone. Uh, can you hear the interpreter now? Yes. OK, OK, let's go. <laughs> Now, I've been listening to the two presentations today, 
and the uh, Singapore Science uh, Museum uh, exhibition, uh, I've already seen it. Uh, it was very interesting. I was very impressed. Now, usually, uh, we think to uh, we tend to think with humans in mind, and that's the same for augmentation as well as the symbiosis. So we put uh, humans at the center, and then I think of symbiosis in that uh, context or always. But uh, today, listening to the presentation, Funai san, uh, you said that uh, um, you talked about the food and humans, uh, but uh, you have also given us the context of the Earth. Uh, which is a different perspective to what uh, we are used to. And Onasan, I felt that uh, listening to your presentation, it means that uh, the uh, human-centric uh, uh, worldview uh, is now uh, becoming a more cosmic or a more uh, cosmopolitan uh, worldview. And uh, in the new context that uh, we can consider uh, what the humans are and uh, the relationship between the human and the cosmos the distance and the positioning has been uh, clarified uh, in a different perspective. And this is a very uh, interesting challenge for us. When we talk about humans, what are we talking about in terms of boundaries? It's very difficult to define because uh, we are made of uh, cells and uh, we have an understanding, but uh, microfauna and uh, is something that we need uh, in our intestines. So we need it in humans, but is that a part of human? Uh, that uh, is very fuzzy. That's the inside of us. And uh, outside, there is information as well as uh, the environment. How can we separate ourselves? Uh, where is a demarcation point? It's very difficult to identify because I think uh, it's extended. Uh, we are talking about the Earth as well as society, but then we have to talk about the universe as well. Because with the smartphones, usage, and uh, uh, now GPS uh, is uh, very convenient for us, and we need satellites uh, to enable the GPS. And uh, Funamatsan, you've talked about uh, crops uh, in uh, various uh, uh, agricultural land. Uh, you have to look at the photographs uh, from the, taken from the satellite in order to identify the ideal uh, agricultural land. So you're taking a cosmic uh, uh, perspective as well. So it seems that the boundaries are becoming fuzzy today. That uh, was my impression. So I have a question now. When we take uh, such a perspective, what is uh, the human uh, within the context of the universe? I'm sorry to be so vague, but uh, uh, I think uh, if you are, uh, the worldview will differ if you take a, hum uh, the, a human uh, perspective or a, a space perspective or universe perspective. How will this differ? I'm sorry, it's a difficult question. Make sure I got the yeah. translation right. Yeah. Is uh, what is the role, or how do we think about humans in this yeah. both Earth context and space context? Yeah. And what is the perspective of the, what human is from the human-centric point of view, as opposed to the cosmology-centric view, mm -hmm. and put the human in the context of the uh, universe. Universe. Yeah. So I would say, uh, perhaps from the human-centric view, in the context of the universe, we are explorers, mm. right? Mm -hmm. We're explorers on Earth for many uh, millennia, and then now we're at this point where we're getting a chance to be explorers of the cosmos. Mm. And there's a beautiful symbiosis, I think, between Earth and space and our future goals going forward. And then from the cosmos' perspective, we are smaller than ants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are, um, it's very humbling sometimes to think about if there was a, a way to look back on just Earth or okay. even human beings from the cosmos, cosmological perspective, we are so small. Um, and yet the life that we know is our life, and so that feels big for us. Use this one instead. Is this better? Or should I just do yeah, one yes, or the yes, other? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the things to, is this on? Yeah, easy, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things we think about at the Media Lab in the context of uh, human uh, symbiosis going off into space is the tardigrade. 
um, these incredible tiny little micro uh, microorganisms known affectionately as water bears. And when you ask us how do we think about humans in the context of the universe and symbiosis, we always have this paradigm that when a human goes out into space or any organism from the Earth goes out into space, they have to be encased in this environmental bubble that is mimicking Earth, right, so that they can, can survive. But with the tardigrade and looking at these properties that allow this little organism to survive in the vacuum, survive with extremes of temperature, can we flip the paradigm and say, how can we take the genetic properties in a tardigrade, put it into a human or into another organism, and make ourselves more naturally space tolerant? And so maybe that's an exciting ah. new way for a symbiosis between nature and humans as we go out into the cosmos. なるほど。た、確かにそのタルガーというかクマムシですよね。そのクマムシの例。So that's about the tardigrade,、uh, which is a quite interesting example. Well, Space Shuttle or ISS, probably the tardigrade was、uh, also featured in the experiment. And not 100% the,、uh, the uh, survival in the,、uh, the universe, but they can survive in the vacuum and the,、uh, cosm uh, the, uh, in the uh, cosmotic uh, the atmosphere they can, or the、uh, environment they can survive. So the,、uh, as the,、uh, hum um, the So the,、uh, it is a very important the observation to look at that particularly about the、uh, microorganisms. So the、uh, genetics, well, the,、uh, the expert, do you have any comment on this point? Yes,、yeah, so it, I think、uh, to answer the first question and to follow up on some of the genetic payloads that can protect us, we, we know that you can adjust P53 genes that can give you extra、um, mechanisms to repair your DNA, which gets damaged. We can take a lot of lessons from tardigrades or other bacteria. Which、uh, Bacillus pumilus can sporulate and survive outside the space station. And、uh, I, I think we, we've just begun to discover、uh, a lot of the genes, even in the human DNA. So I'll, I'll talk about this tomorrow, but we know that there's about、uh, 60,000 genes in the human genome, but 10 years ago there were 50,000 genes, and 15 years ago there were only about 40,000 genes. So we, we are still discovering the genes in our own DNA as well as all those around us. And so I think. Uh, the toolkit that we have, the, the hammer and the nails, and essentially the screwdrivers of our genetic、um, sort of you know, tools are very limited. We only have、uh, begun to scratch the surface. So I'm very excited for what's coming next, where we can actually, at a super exponential rate, discover、uh, from a pure joy of discovery perspective all the genes that we can use to begin adapting life、uh, for space. And to, to follow up on the first question, I think、uh, from the cosmic perspective, we're very small, very, very much so, but I think it's also worth,、um, you know, how do we, every time we touch hands, we exchange microbiome. Every time we sit in the chair, you're all leaving <laughs> microbiomes on your chairs right now, and、uh, we could sequence them once you leave the room、uh, and see what you brought with you. And so it's hard to, to tell the difference when we're all exchanging DNA and cells constantly. But I do think we're unique in one way is that、uh, humans are the only species that we know of that is aware of the fact that the universe、uh, could end and, and probably will end in some way. And so I, I think that gives us a unique、uh, perspective as well as responsibility、uh, in the universe. Uh, in outer space,、uh, when you talk about、uh, genes or when、uh, living organisms go、uh, to the space,、uh, the microgravity environment、uh, will have、uh, an impact. What is known now is that、uh, how is it different to、uh, how, how will our cells be impacted、uh, if we go to outer space? Because if we take、uh, the cells、uh, in microgravity space, is it going to change then? Or is it、uh, through generations a new evolution will take place to, for adaptation?、Uh, if that is the case, how do you think、uh, we will transform?、Uh, we'll likely be very much taller. I think there'll be less gravity. <laughs> I think there'll be.、Uh, we, so we've seen from the,、uh, the NASA twin study where we've been studying、uh, identical twins, one on Earth and one in space. For a, one year in space to see what happens to the body during long space missions. We've seen some, some things you would expect. So, for example, many genes change their expression that deal with、uh, bodily stress or hypoxia. Actually, the reason you see hypoxia is because when you breathe in space,、uh, you get a cloud of carbon dioxide by your face. And if you don't move around that much or if there's no fan,、uh, you will get a little bit of、uh, hypoxia just from sitting still in zero gravity. Uh, or also, we've seen that the telomeres got longer in space. Those are the,、wow. the, the bottoms of those shoelaces at the end of all your DNA and your chromosomes. 
the protective layer, we thought it would get shorter. It actually got longer uh, for reasons we do not understand yet. We don't, don't know why that is, but you know, we've seen, uh, but for the most part, the body is under near constant assault, that, that you are losing bone density, you have many uh, signatures of cell death, you have a lot of stress on the body. And uh, when Scott Kelly returned to Earth, he's begun to publish uh, some of uh, excerpts from a book about what, ha what happened. And so he actually uh, couldn't really have that many clothes on when he got back because the weight of the clothes was so heavy that it hurt his skin uh, after he had been in space for a year. So I, I think we'll have to figure out ways to uh, adjust the skin uh, and our body when we get to other planets. I want to add another um, interesting thought experiment to that. So if you imagine that there's a human population here on Earth and we are able physically to send colonists to Mars, if you imagine far in the future humans who have evolved on Mars or have spent you know, their life there, uh, they'll be taller, ganglier, their muscles will be weaker. Mm -hmm. It's much harder for them to come back and participate yeah. on Earth than it is for us to go okay. there. So maybe in the future there's this odd dichotomy between where did you grow up and where does that mean that you can or cannot participate um, in the solar system or beyond. Tashka. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. James Hogan, well, the uh, SF, uh, the uh, novelist, he wrote a book uh, featuring uh, humans, uh, the uh, humans uh, who used to grow up in the, the Mars and also in the, uh, the, on the Earth, and the, uh, they uh, grew quite uh, separately, and they turned out to be giants, uh, those people who lived in the, the Mar uh, Mars. Well, the, uh, the same uh, the human beings, however, the, uh, they have weaker muscles, and they grew into a different shape, and they came back to the Earth. I read that uh, novel, yes. Uh, so the, uh, it is a science uh, fiction topic, and uh, it was uh, something interesting, and the, uh, it show, showing that the, uh, the outer space environment is quite uh, difficult and harsh on the human beings. But the, uh, about the universe, of course, uh, the, uh, the, we went there, uh, there are some of us went there, and we came to know more about the universe. But the, uh, the first contact type, that, that is the, uh, the uh, very interesting genre of the uh, science fiction. About 40 years ago, Cross encounter with the third, con uh, third kind, that was the, uh, the movie. And 20 years ago, well, the contact by Carl Sagan, contact by uh, Jodie Foster, and this year, Sony Picture, well, they, uh, they uh, launched the uh, movie Arrival. And the message is the Japanese title of that movie, but it is a very interesting uh, cinema, very interesting. Uh, the close encounter with the third, count, uh, the third kind, well, the, the French, uh, the linguist, uh, the actually emerged, uh, they uh, appeared, and their contact, Jody Foster, and arrival, once again, linguist, linguistic uh, the expert, and they played a uh, central role. So the, uh, the, when the uh, people think about the universe, they, uh, we feel fantasy, and also the uh, 2001 uh, Space Odyssey is another one. So Okajima-san, I want to ask you, well, maybe you expected my question. So your company, ALE, you create artificial shooting stars. And microsatellite uh, they creates the, uh, the artificial shooting star, meaning that it is a very difficult reality uh, the, in the universe. Well, that's uh, what you have to look at. But the, uh, looking from the, the Earth, it is uh, fantastic and romantic. It is a shooting star, which is a show that you are designing. So the, uh, what made you uh, they come up with this uh, idea, if you could explain? Now, uh, I am trying to create uh, a shooting star. And uh, we will have uh, uh, granules uh, placed in the satellites, and uh, the granules uh, will be dispersed uh, from outer space. And uh, uh, as it goes into, uh, comes to down to Earth, uh, it will look like a, uh, like a shooting star. The reason why I want to do this is because uh, I have been studying astronomy, uh, and uh, basic science uh, is very important uh, because uh, it will give uh, a jump up uh, to the lives of people. Uh, because uh, with technology, you can only have linear growth. It just goes smaller or um, faster or more convenient. But innovation uh, is brought about uh, by basic science only. And uh, with basic science, uh, it can uh, give a big jump to the lives uh, of uh, the uh, people. Without uh, the law of relativity, uh, there is no um, uh, smartphones today. The reason why we are able to use smartphones uh, is because of accumulation of the basic science, and with that, uh, mankind has uh, undergone change. That is the reason why I, we need to develop uh, uh, basic science further. And 
since I had a background in astronomy, I focus on uh, the shooting star. So shooting star can be provided, and uh, uh, entertainment uh, could be provided uh, on Earth. And on the other hand, uh, it uh, will also uh, promote basic science as well. That is the reason why I established my company, AIL. In terms of uh, basic science uh, development, uh, our shooting star uh, will give uh, more uh, visibility uh, to uh, the uh, the um, stratosphere as well. And a natural uh, shooting star uh, could have uh, bacteria or virus uh, that uh, is a source of uh, life. We are flourishing uh, on Earth, but we may have come from outer space. So that is the reason why I feel my project is very interesting and compelling. So the uh, you well the uh, p position that as the uh, something entertaining uh, entertainment and also the uh, you thought a lot about the uh, enhancing the uh, basic uh, the uh, the uh, science that is quite interesting. So the uh, with that in mind, for the humans looking at the universe, well the uh, we feel something romantic, including the uh, shooting stars. But the uh, Nanjo Sam, sorry, I'm asking you now. So talking about art and artistic uh, area, what kind of uh, changes that we go through when it comes to artistic and uh, the relationship between human and the, uh, the universe? Yes, it is the, uh, the long and uh, the uh, standing relationship. We have been watching the, oh, the, uh, the moon and the sun, for, uh, and they were really uh, symbolic entities. And it was the, uh, the major topic for the, uh, the human beings and the uh, major, well, the core part of the civilizations in the world. So. Well, the, uh, the universe itself is something mysterious. You can see it. You, uh, it is up there, but uh, you cannot reach it. It's there, but we can only imagine about the universe. So it is, uh, in a sense, real, but it is remote at the same time, far away from the human beings. But the, unlike other stories, it's there. universe is there, and we have to accept it as the, uh, the fact. Then what is it? So that's the uh, major question mark for the uh, human beings. And then, who are we as uh, compared to the universe? So the, uh, it, there is a relationship between humans and the uh, universe. So the, uh, well, the importance associated with the universe is also closely linked to the human beings. Who are we uh, in this universe? And I believe it is uh, the, uh, the uh, internal part of uh, civilizations. So sh creating shooting stars, that's quite uh, romantic. And I believe it is the, uh, the ultimate form of the uh, civilization and also art. Well, I never imagined that it's possible, but technically speaking, it's almost complete. So the, uh, for the, uh, the birthday uh, by your loved ones, I don't know how much it's going to cost, maybe four million yen or so, or more. Let's say, well, they uh, pay four million yen, and then you can uh, present the uh, shooting stars for your sweetheart, and then propose a marriage. That's a nice way to use it. And also collaboration with an artist is uh, another possibility. By using shooting stars, what kind of production, what kind of representation can we make? Artists are interested. Uh, so the, uh, there's a high affinity between what I can do and also artists. So the Okajima-san, when I talked with uh, uh, what you do at your company, well, the, I talked with the uh, eventer uh, the, uh, doing some kind of uh, the, uh, performance, uh, and then the, uh, they're interested. Well, the, he was really interested, and the, uh, he said that he wants to use it, the shooting star, next week. So I want to ask you, Funahashi-san. Uh, no. To you, um, you have talked about agriculture. That is uh, terrestrial. It's on Earth. And there is the conventional agricultural method. There is origin. But there is also the, uh, the Sinaiko culture is uh, very different in terms of the world view, uh, the uh, Western as well as the Eastern. and. Uh, in that context, the uh, African uh, worldview will may be different as well. Is that having an impact to, on the agricultural methods adopted according to experience? 
Well, you talked about the East, West, and Africa. I've been to all these locations, but uh, I have feel affinity everywhere. I don't really recognize the difference. In fact, I think there are more commonalities rather than differences, uh, according to my personal experience. I've been listening to other comments. Uh, you're talking about the universe, the cosmos, and uh, it's uh, something to look up at. And uh, beyond that, uh, there is also the cosmos uh, at our feet as well in the Japanese context. If we look, uh, talk about the cosmos uh, in the air, um, I am losing hope somewhat because uh, if you have a higher scale, then uh, humans uh, will become very small and it's not relevant to in the context of the universe. From other uh, living organisms, uh, it's better to have less humans. Uh, we have, there are too many humans are having a detrimental impact on other living organisms. So if we're going to increase uh, uh, humans, we have to increase uh, other uh, types, uh, other species as well, uh, for the sake of uh, symbiosis. And uh, uh, what I am talking about in terms of uh, the, uh, the cosmos below, uh, we're talking about uh, cells uh, to the universe, and uh, they're increasing by a factor of 10 or uh, 10, 100. But you're talking about the universe overall, uh, uh, the microorganism as w and the large uh, cosmos, astronomical cosmos, as well as the uh, ecosystem and living organisms are all a cosmos, but uh, diff belonging to a different uh, hierarchy. It's about 10,000 years uh, since agriculture began, and it has uh, gone through a process of evolution. And uh, uh, efficiency was uh, sought, uh, controlling according to the knowledge of humans. And scale is expanding, and uh, it is very complex, more than people understand. And that is the reason why a basic uh, science uh, will, can provide a new paradigm, and I think that uh, better understanding can be uh, brought about. Uh, that is how complex uh, the uh, impact is. Now, but now we can uh, um, use ICT uh, to understand better uh, the uh, cosmos as well as the environment around us. If we take uh, humans uh, to uh, outer space, uh, uh, muscles become weaker, and uh, um, you have to uh, put uh, the microorganisms within a body uh, as a part of human, otherwise we will not be able to sustain us, we cannot continue living. Uh, agriculture began 10,000 years ago, but uh, hunting and gathering uh, was uh, taking place as well uh, in uh, 50 years or 100 years. Uh, cultivation uh, in a full-fledged manner is being conducted only for a very uh, short period of time. And we have not yet optimized this process. Maybe 200 years uh, out, uh, we'll be able to uh, find a solution. But we can't wait for that. Uh, that is the reason why I'm focused on agriculture rather than medicine. So uh, the, the worldview uh, connecting the environment and humans is very important. And uh, we have to look at all the cosmos uh, in the air, in, uh, above us as well as below us as well. Uh, Fractical and Paolo. Um, the observation scale, uh, whether it is microscopic or macroscopic, uh, you should uh, be able to identify the same uh, phenomenon. So it's not a cultural difference. I think it's a difference in perspective. Yes, so um, I was very interested to hear about your founding of this new term, Seneco culture, Seneco culture. And it reminded me um, of another concept I've just heard of for agriculture in the cosmos context, in the space mm. context, yeah. uh, which is you take the roots of mycelium, called mycoculture, um, and use these materials from mushrooms as a binding material to make bricks that are fundamental layers that can then be used as space architecture. And the reason they're interested in doing this is that it's actually a very robust way uh, to bind materials together without expensive chemicals and a lot of energy, which will be hard to come by in a resource-limited environment, say, on Mars. And so something that you said that really struck me that was beautiful, which is we take these cells from below us and then thinking about going up in the air above us, and maybe this mycoculture is a way to take cells from below us, these roots of fungi and mushrooms, bake them into building material that's agricultural in nature, and then you know be able to take it to the cosmos slowly, as a slowly. building. Oh, I'll slow down. <laughs> <We'll> do. <laughs> Should I try again a little slower? <laughs> so um, there's this concept 
mycelia, the roots of mushrooms, and they can be used as a binding agent mm. within other materials, other mm. organic materials like sawdust mm. um, or uh, cinder chips. And when you compress these materials under a lot of pressure, the um, material in the mycelium, the mushrooms, binds it together into a very sturdy building block. And so there's interest in taking this mycoculture where you mm. harvest the um, mushrooms on the earth beneath our feet, like you said, and then taking this as a building material into the future um, for colonization on Mars, mm. where you would not be able to rely on traditional materials, but you might want to be able to grow your building materials. And I thought your concept for the importance of this new type of agriculture mm. has a certain synergy um, with thinking about agriculture for the future of space colonies. Uh, I have another question. Uh, uh, what uh, would you do uh, in uh, um, the uh, there is if there is a mission to Mars uh, for teleformation? Uh, no, I think I would be left uh, in Mars uh, if there is a uh, uh, terraformation, and I would probably be doing agriculture there. And uh, I saw a movie, and uh, they were raising uh, potatoes as monoculture, but uh, the. Material support uh, is very important. Uh, and the uh, cynical culture is such that uh, uh, the variables that you have to control are different. Uh, you have, up to now, agriculture, in agriculture, you had to uh, intervene in various uh, processes of, and uh, using uh, fertilizer, agriculture chemicals, and uh, cost is very significant. Uh, but in the case of uh, uh, cynical culture, you have to set the right condition, then otherwise you don't have to intervene at all. Uh, it's all automated. Um, for There is uh, the granules of uh, soil. How We don't touch any organic materials, but uh, uh, we can set up uh, the right uh, uh, condition. Otherwise, we leave everything to the ecology. Uh, but uh, whether we can do this in a close environment or not uh, is uh, the issue. Because uh, in terms of clothes, uh, you have to consider uh, scale. Um, Earth is also um, closed. Uh, there are um, s some movement, uh, but uh, compared to Earth, uh, it's just uh, the solar uh, uh, impact only. And otherwise, the Earth is, is, a com is uh, contained. And uh, in the desert, uh, recently I visited and I found a very big dome uh, in the desert. It's glass dome, and uh, a tropical forest uh, was created. Uh, also, um, a, w uh, a sea was created, uh, and uh, there were successes and failures. And uh, uh, plants uh, was uh, dense, and it was mixed, and uh, tropical uh, forest uh, was very successful. But uh, when they tried to express uh, the sea as a pool, uh, the volume was uh, too small. And uh, the, there was acidification of uh, seas. And you can see uh, the sea uh, was very um, uh, dirty and very it's not appropriate. Uh, therefore, if you want to have the space uh, colony, and if you want to have the Earth type uh, ecosystem, uh, you have to consider how much scale you can ensure, or how much you can mimic from the deep waters, uh, deep seas. Uh, deep sea uh, is very much related to uh, climate change as well, so we cannot exclude that either. So how much you can ensure uh, all these uh, different environments uh, would be the key. And if you want to take this to Mars, uh, and if this is technically possible, then I believe that uh, the uh, criteria will be to resolve the climate change problem. Everyone wants to want to go to Mars, uh, but uh, and I feel that way too. And it's not a pessimistic uh, proposal. If you really truly want to go to Mars, uh, you have to be able to um, terraform uh, the Earth uh, to go to Mars. Because uh, we can't uh, um, go to Mars just because Earth is destroyed. Because uh, the population is going to increase. And uh, uh, so we have to take the diversity as well as the increasing population to Mars. 
actually, I'm a moderator, but I want to ask you. So when people go to the Mars, both the environment of the Earth cannot be replicated on Mars. Then the, uh, the plants and the uh, living organisms, uh, the, uh, are we supposed to change them by uh, genetic modification? Well, the, uh, we will be able to modify the, uh, the living organisms to the new environment. What is your idea? Well, the, I don't think Mars is that, not that tolerant to accept such organisms. So the, uh, well, the uh, genome, high level, the, uh, the, uh, the interpretations is uh, the, uh, very uh, complex. And the, uh, so the gene expression, for example, let's say there are 10,000, well, there are 10,000 genes. And then 10,000 by 10,000, that is not the, uh, so the, it is uh, 10,000 times to the power of 10,000. So the, uh, that is the, uh, the, um, the, the variety that we have to handle. So the, as the, uh, the, uh, the biological, the, uh, the progress uh, on the earth, well, the, uh, we have the, uh, the history of the evolution of a living creatures. So as for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, turning desert into green, well, the, by using the, uh, the earth and the resources, we will be able to solve that problem of desertification. And I think it is a matter of time and ethics to go to Mars. If we can do anything, then of course uh, we can modify the, the living, uh, living organisms and send them to the Mars. But still, the, uh, we don't know how many years it's going to take, tens of thousands of years maybe. But the, uh, the biological, the, uh, the, uh, the time is um, much longer than the uh, human time. And, but the, uh, in the end, we may end up having the uh, totally different uh, living uh, the organisms. And the, uh, it uh, may have the, uh, uh, the uh, beauty in itself. It's uh, hard to decompose. So the, it is one functionality from a genetic point of view. But the, uh, it is uh, the beauty in the time span of almost close to eternity. And the, uh, the genetic modification is still in a rudimentary stage to achieve that. And Christopher, oh, this uh, slide. Well, you also talked about the, uh, the going to the, uh, the Mars. So the genetic uh, modified organism is in, uh, included in your project? So there's um, an ongoing work to modify bacter bacteria as well as human cells and also potentially plant cells to be able to survive uh, on Mars. There's a lot more radiation is the biggest problem. So you would have to have a lot of mechanisms to repair the DNA and to survive the radiation. Of course, there's not much atmosphere. There is also uh, not much water. And so there's some challenges um, to go there. I, I often like to make the uh, analogy of what happened when uh, people came and, and Columbus and, and settlers, the Puritans came to the United States. Uh, it was a one-way trip. They, they couldn't go back, they mo or they could, but it was very hard. It was effectively a one-way trip. So there's been times in our history when they came and in that first winter, over 90% of the settlers died. They, mm. they didn't make it that first winter, but then more came the next year. And so I think uh, that might be similar to Mars. Uh, people will, it will not be easy. People will probably die, but then I think hopefully more will come and we could embed them with as many defenses as possible. But there was an atmosphere in the United States when they got there, though, yeah. whereas in Mars there isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, to your point, uh, if I uh, take a constructive uh, uh, approach, uh, let's put aside the ethics for the time being, but uh, there are different uh, um, uh, transformation uh, mutations uh, that uh, can be tested. Uh, we can create the many muta mutants. Uh, uh, probably ISS can do this, and uh, we can send them to Mars and uh, put them in the groundwater and uh, find out uh, what is going to happen a uh, hundred years out. Uh, because uh, the, um, the physical, uh, chemical uh, 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 structure is not uh, clear. That is the reason why terraformation is necessary. So even if you create an ecosystem, you may not be able to protect uh, the, that. But uh, for the time being, uh, you can take uh, uh, all the life forms uh, in Mars. Uh, then extreme mutants uh, ch should be sent to the uh, groundwater. So you, and they will turn out to be aliens when you go and visit later, probably. But uh, um, I don't think we should send and uh, um, the um, uh, and so we don't know how they will be able to return. Uh, but uh, in the uh, train, someone said that uh, even if it's one way, she would like to go. Uh, regarding the atmosphere, uh, our 
uh, shooting star will emit uh, some ozone. So uh, in the, if you send a lot of uh, uh, shooting stars, uh, you can create an ozone layer around the mass, uh, which will protect the, the living organisms on Mars. And according to calculation, it will take time, but uh, it is a possibility that uh, we can consider. One remaining technical challenge uh, to terraforming Mars, even if you could solve the august genetic engineering problem, is that Mars uh, has a very cool core compared to the core of the Earth, and so there's not a magnetic field around Mars in the way that there is on the Earth, and which is what allows us on Earth to keep our atmosphere. So you could use many shooting stars and create an atmosphere around Mars, perhaps, but it wouldn't stay for very long because there's no protection there. So maybe what we need to be thinking of is some way to create an artificial uh, magnetosphere, artificial uh, magnetic field for Mars to protect yeah. your genetic mm -hmm. um, modified and organisms. I, I want to add something. We only have three minutes left, so we'd like to conclude this uh, session. And I'd like to ask uh, the Ms. Uh, Ona uh, the Haja, and what is the arts and science that they, we have to consider? Well, the most inspiring arts and science that uh, we have to consider as, we, uh, the, as a result of this uh, discussion. You know, what we can take from uh, the, the discussion amongst us here is that it's the symbiosis of fields that is going to generate the new learning that we need to either solve some of the major crises that we have right here on our planet, in our own ecosystem, or to create new ecosystems um, that you know, might exist elsewhere in the universe. Um, it's not one field alone that's going to achieve that, whether it's you know, kind of uh, engineering or biotechnology, you know, kind of, or, you know, botany um, or art. It's all of these fields in uh, symbiosis and conversation and deep collaboration and dialogue um, that are likely to be able to create robust, sustainable, resilient solutions. Um, we all have our own, you know, kind of angles and specialities, but it's when we bring them together uh, into a kind of uh, a, a dialogue and into harmony that we end up creating, you know, kind of these these sort of giant leaps in progress. Now, uh, I wasn't uh, sure how this uh, session is going to proceed, but I think it's, it gets very exciting when we talk about uh, uni the universe. We are talking about uh, symbiosis, uh, but uh, expanding uh, the human race uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, the Earth and going into space. Uh, is uh, very exciting. Um, so that means that uh, genetic modified uh, organisms can be sent and uh, art uh, will be necessary. But uh, this is a uh, predatory relationship uh, is also part of a symbiosis. We have to consider this. Uh, we might uh, become the prey. Uh, then we have to uh, brace ourselves for that as well. Uh, that is, uh, after all, symbiosis. I think we've had a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, Nanjo-san, please. Uh, uh, Ona-san, you showed us the three exhibitions. The one, the, the, the one in the middle was the, the traveling uh, uh, exhibition. And there was uh, a Mars architecture included in that exhibition. And the uh, Japanese architectural team was uh, awarded the Grand Prix at uh, NASA. And that model was uh, exhibited. Uh, using uh, the ice at the core of uh, the Mars, a uh, dome was created. And within the dome, uh, agriculture or uh, plant cultivation uh, was uh, uh, included. There was also a uh, place to live. There was also garden uh, included. And uh, so it was very relevant to what uh, uh, Funabashi-san has mentioned. So we cannot uh, completely adapt uh, to uh, uh, Mars, uh, but we can provide uh, a living environment uh, uh, by creating a dome. Uh, that was very interesting because uh, it seemed that uh, everyone's comments were interconnected. So when we talk about uh, the space and universe, it might seem irrelevant to our daily lives, but that is not the case when we consider the possibilities of humankind. Uh, it's a very important platform for us to consider seriously. So with that, we'd like to bring this uh, discussion to a close. Thank you very much.